Welcome to video 2B on the sources of tax law. Financial accounting basically has one source for all guidance. That's the accounting standards codification. Of course, I exaggerate a bit because the Securities Exchange Commission releases guidance for public companies, IFRS can apply to certain international businesses, etc. But 95% of what you deal with from an accounting perspective comes straight from the codification. Unfortunately, tax law comes from many sources. Undoubtedly, one of the primary sources of these is the Internal Revenue Code, but that doesn't nearly cover everything. This video is an introduction to the sources of tax law. Let's get going. The world of tax law is complex, and as a result, there are two separate sets of tax law. Primary tax law, which are the official sources that can be relied upon, and secondary tax law, which are unofficial and may be only relied upon when no primary tax law exists, and even then, only with caution. Primary sources come in three categories. Statutory or legislative law, administrative law, and judicial law. This chart shows the relative hierarchy of the sources of tax law. The hierarchy shown within any category is more reliable than the hierarchy between categories. For example, is a treasury regulation on equal footing with an appellate court decision? Well, not necessarily, but an appellate decision has greater weight than a district court opinion. Let's start with primary sources, as of course they are the important ones. Legislative or statutory sources are derived from the law, thus the name. The highest law of the land in the U.S. is our Constitution, which of course includes the power to tax. Tax treaties are another form of legislative tax law, where the U.S. and another nation agree to certain tax terms for cross-border transactions. Treaties are generally designed to make life easier for taxpayers. Interestingly, the U.S. Senate has not ratified a single tax treaty since 2010. New treaties have been negotiated but remain unratified. If you're interested in this, Google Rand Paul and tax treaties. This is how tax laws are passed in the U.S. Since this isn't a civics class, I'm not going to cover this in any greater detail. The Internal Revenue Code is probably the most useful piece of statutory tax law. As you may know, the laws of the United States are codified into the U.S. Code. Title 26 of the U.S. Code is the Internal Revenue Code and contains most but not all of the tax laws. This slide presents the structure of the U.S. Tax Code. CPAs typically refer to the code at the section level. Each section within the Internal Revenue Code is unique and only used once. When needed, citations to the code will occur at a deeper level, for example, at the paragraph or clause level. If a code section, for example, is 15 pages long, it really doesn't help the reader to only cite the code section. You would be forcing the reader to review all 15 pages to find the relevant piece of tax law. This would definitely be a situation where referring to a lower strata, such as a subsection paragraph, subparagraph clause, in the code would make a lot of sense. The Internal Revenue Code is set up in a reasonably meaningful way. You can see the subchapters and parts try to break down the code into meaningful chunks. The most significant source of administrative tax laws are the Treasury regulations. These are the IRS's interpretations of what the Internal Revenue Code says, because Congress is, well, not always crystal clear on the meaning of certain items in the code. Regulations come in three forms, final, temporary, and proposed. Final have the highest authority, but believe it or not, so do temporary. 
proposed regs are actually the lowest regulations until they are accepted as final. Regulations can be a great friend to the tax professional. For example, in Code Section 41 on the R&D credit, the credit amount is 20% of qualified research expenses. However, the code utterly fails to define qualified research expenses. As a result, the regulations contain a definition to assist taxpayers in making good decisions around the R&D credit. Most Treasury regulations are considered helpful in assisting tax professionals understand the code. However, some are not taxpayer friendly, and they come under attack for that reason. We generally like clarity, unless that clarity ends up making us, may port, may, making us pay more taxes. However, sometimes the regulations can be written as poorly as the code. Regulations currently go through an exposure process, much like the accounting standards updates. These days, temporary regulations are also issued in proposed form, but that was not always the case, which is why you can still find temporary re regulations in force that might be well over 20 years old. The IRS issues a great deal of other taxpayer guidance through revenue rulings, revenue procedures, and letter rulings. But be careful. IRS publications such as IRS Publication 17 and IRS Forms and Instructions are not considered primary sources of tax law. And we cover these in much greater detail in the RIA Checkpoint review videos. Our third leg of tax law is the judiciary. Courts in the U.S. are used to settle difference of opinions between taxpayers and the IRS. Because of the concept of precedent, a court holding can become de facto law unless it's later addressed by changes to the code by Congress. As a result, lots of tax law is buried inside the multitude of tax cases that have been heard over the years. When the audit goes bad, you start at the trial level court and you have three choices. The tax court is a common choice because you generally don't have to pay in order to file suit. The other two courts require that you pay the tax and then sue for a refund in order to go to court. Tax court judges are specialists and therefore more capable of dealing with technical tax issues, while the other court's justices are generalists. Lastly, the district court permits a jury. If the taxpayer or the government loses, the next step is to appeal your case into the circuit courts of appeal, sometimes either called the circuit courts or appellate courts. There are 13 circuits in the U.S. that are defined geographically. San Diego, and all of California for that matter, for example, are inside the Ninth Circuit. If you lose at the appellate courts, your last hope is the Supreme Court. You must petition the Supreme Court, and they are not required to hear your case. Of course, if you lose at the Supreme Court, your next appeal is, I guess, to God. So, good luck with that. As I mentioned previously, in the U.S., precedent matters through a concept we know as stare decisis which basically means that the court will follow previous decisions or the decisions of a higher court. And this is intended to increase the stability of court decisions over time. Because the tax court travels around the country moving from place to place, it uses the Golson rule, which says they're going to look to the higher court that is over the district in which that taxpayer resides and that prevents them from applying whatever circuit standard they would like to. There is no code of judicial decisions. Instead, each case is reported separately into a bound volume, which, of course, they are electronic today. These reporters are published by private companies, and as a result, a single case could be reported in multiple reporters, and therefore have multiple citation forms. The book does a good job of describing these, so I'm not going to cover them in this lecture. That is the end of video 2B 
on the sources of tax law. There's a large part of this chapter devoted to tax research. You should read those sections, but they're not going to be on your quizzes or your exams. Instead, there's a tax research case that's assigned in week two that's going to require you to use that information. Thanks for watching.